Uh, I'm still uh, fixing some things. I woke up like 10 minutes ago. Anyway, I'm, uh, I'm making a coffee. <laughs> Fortunately, all I have is microwave. There we go. Okay. Water hot. Dun dun dun. There we go. Still putting together my coffee. Very important part of the ritual of getting back home after work, passing out, and then waking up in a groggy state in like two to three hours and being like, that oh, was a nap, bliss.
You know, you didn't have a good nap unless you woke up and are just like, what year is it? smart coffee making. To the milk direction you go. Ah, oh, right. I streamed this last week and then I never even got past the prologue. Ah, oh, joy. I'm reminded of how recently I've been playing uh, Grand Order. And I've been trying to catch up on the story. But my plan to do so has just been hitting skip through all of the missions and just reading it after I'm actually done with the uh, done with the chapter very good very ready Am I truly ready to speak the words that is in a visual novel in front of my face as if there's a... Yes. The fight to the death between seven participants of which only one can survive. It's said that a holy grail exists in the land of Fuyuki and that a number of mages fought over it in the past. Their one and only objective was to obtain the relic called the Holy Grail. However, the Grail's origins are unclear. We're sure it isn't the chalice that held the blood of God, but its power is fearsome enough to be compared to the genuine article. That's right. They say the Holy Grail can grant any wish. Only one person can possess it. The Holy Grail can only grant one wish for one person. Despite that, seven mages are needed to summon the Grail to this land. Seven collaborators to collaborate to one miracle. So, as you might imagine, it was only a matter of time before they started fighting over the Grail. Like so many conflicts, it started as a competition over property rights. The seven mages equally use the power of the Holy Grail to summon their respective familiars and do battle over the Grail itself. Only one mage can obtain the Grail. As a result, seven people who started as colleagues ended up in a ferocious battle to the death. Yeah, that's why I fucking... Yu Dao is... sitting on top of like a pile of 18 Grails because like... I don't feel like using them to increase the level cap of my servants. That's the gist of the ritual known as the Holy Grail War, a struggle for ownership between mages. The mages chosen by the Holy Grail are called masters. <sighs> oh, there's the ons. Who use the blessing of the Grail to acquire powerful familiars known as servants. Saber, Lancer, Archer, we went too fast for me to read them out. Two things serve as proof that one has become a master. The summoning and command of a servant. And the mark of command spells to compel the servant's servitude. The first goes without saying. 
You archer I summoned yesterday. No. A few hours ago, to be exact. Is Rin Tosaka's servant. As for the second, the master must closely guard the command spells that control one servant. This is probably the most critical aspect of being a master. And good old Gudao can just wait a day for a new, new, new seal. When I summoned Archer, symbols appeared on my right hand, namely command spells. Stigmata bestowed by the Holy Grail upon the summoning of a servant that marks one's new status as a master. A massive amount of magical energy is compressed into these seals, whose power is fleeting rather than long-lasting. They disappear once they're used, and as their shape suggests, its mark represents a single use. In other words, one only gets three shots. The master who has used up all three command spells can no longer control a servant, and is as good as dead. Therefore, command spells must be handled with care. <sighs> Until the very end, since they're as valuable as one's own life. It pains me to no end that I burned one right off the bat. But it wasn't a total waste. So, I'll chalk it up as a win. After all, a servant could turn on its master at any time. If one command spells what it takes to put a collar on him, then I consider it fair trade. That's about it for the broader strokes of this business. Once seven servants have been summoned, the Holy Grail War will begin. The night's sleep will be a fitful one. I don't know what the final master will appear, but they could be right around the corner. Bone of my sword. Hmm. Is that morning already? I feel sluggish. My blurry gaze goes up to the window, only to see that it's already getting bright outside. It's after nine. It doesn't even count as being tardy. After a drowsy check of the clock, I make up my mind to skip school today. Body's heavy. Feels like that business mostly drained me. Sitting up in bed, I heave a long sigh. Not being a morning person isn't enough to explain why I feel so dull. I think Archer mentioned someone about it. A master would be out of commission after summoning a servant. That's right. Summon Archer, not Saber. I remember it all clearly now. I'd rather not, to be honest. But it's not as if denying the facts will let me do it over. It'll take a day or so to recover my power. I'll just treat the day like a break-in period. I drag myself out of bed. Mental boxing match rages between the outside air, which is quite warm for winter, and the comfort of my bed sheets. It concludes in a three-second knockout against the temptation of going back to sleep. Ah. I check my body in the mirror. Nothing out of place aside from the loss of my usual magical energy. Not that it's a problem. I review the situation. I summon the servant, Archer, who doesn't have an ounce of respect for his master. To make matters worse, he doesn't even know who he is. Wow. Talk about a headache. I guess that means his trump card is off the table until his memories come back. Can't expect him to use a power he doesn't even remember.
Serpents are strong familiars, all on their own. But what makes them truly formidable is the secret weapon they each possess. Frustratingly, Archie claims to have forgotten what his is. It's my fault he's in this state, so I'll just have to make it work. We're both in the same boat then. I can only pray that he'll sort his memories out, but who knows how long that might take. Good grief. Really got my work cut out for her. Oh, I might have to reevaluate my opinion of him. The parlor is completely back to normal. Teresa, on. I thought he'd maybe just clear away to detritus, but the room is so spotless I can't help but be impressed. He must have felt bad for wrecking the place. I doubt he would have gone to the trouble otherwise. I guess I ought to commend him for being a more decent guy than I... Still taking your sweet time, I see. Need I remind you that we're wasting daylight? I retract my statement. There isn't a remorseful bone in his body. Good morning, you seem to have made yourself right at home. I did spend the night after all. Oh! I took the occasion to tidy up the kitchen. I expected it to be inadequate, but it's rather thoughtfully furnished. Quite well kept for a girl living alone in a mansion. I have a headache. Why do I have to put up with a servant judging my interior decoration? I thought servants all cared about fighting. Only. Are we sure this guy isn't effective? I see. You weren't in your best condition. You were so feisty last night, but the fatigue must have caught up to you. Hmm. I'll pour you some tea. I hope the lack is fine. Acting like he owns the place, without missing a beat, Archer produces a teacup and fills it with the expensive reddish tea he's been brewing. Why does one of your ascensions not have a maid outfit? This is like day two of our interactions and you're... <laughs> or at least a butler. There's a lot I want to say right now, but oddly enough, I can't work up the indignation to do so. The way he does it all is so refined. I've got to admit, he might be rather cultured. Fine. I am pretty exhausted, so I'll have some. I sit down in the chair. The teacup is placed soundlessly in front of me. I take a sip. Oh! It's delicious. I expected as much since it's my favorite Chinese tea. It's spring a harvest hongcha. I'd be upset if it didn't taste good. On that note, I'd normally be upset if someone used my favorite tea leaves without asking. Hmm. Makes me mad, but the tea was brewed so exquisitely that the pleasure it brings overcomes my anger. <laughs> well, somebody's quite pleased with themselves. To be fair, 
If someone used to fall off my coffee and then there's no coffee, I'd be pretty pissed. But fortunately for everyone involved, my taste in coffee is quite shit. Hey, what's so funny? Well, I was going to ask how you liked it, but your face tells me enough. I sit the teacup down with a forceful thud. Oh, what a waste. You should enjoy it while it's still hot. I can leave if I'm spoiling the mood. No, Nita. Thanks for the tea. I didn't become a master to become a tea snob. And I didn't ask you to do that either. Let's see. I agree. I didn't make a contract with you to be your tea brewer. I'll show more strength in the future if that's what you want. Scenario. Yeah, you're only here to be a combat familiar. Ren is. I have a question of what the other familiars can be used for. Just a. Just a, just a thought. I've never heard of a servant that does household chores, nor do I particularly need one. What do you mean by particularly? In interpret that however you want. More importantly, do you remember who you are yet? Archer shakes his head in the negative. That doesn't bode well. If he can't remember after a single night, his memories probably won't return easily. There's some measures I can try today, but... Alright, I'll think of some solutions for your memory issue. For now, you're ready to head out, Archer. You probably don't know the lay of the land yet, do you? I'll give you a tour of the city. Get ready. There's no need for that, surely. If we're leaving, we should go right now. Do you plan to walk around town in that outfit? Everyone can see that you aren't a normal person, and if another master spots you, they'll know you're a servant right away. I don't plan on announcing our presence to the world. Ah, well that's your concern. There is no problem. While I need to change clothes to blend in, that's only while I'm materialized. Servants are, after all, fundamentally spiritual beings. When we're out of combat, I can take an incorporeal state to reduce the burden on my master. Oh, 
Oh. Okay. Well, that's what makes you a heroic spirit. You need your master's magical energy to form a body, so... I cut that supply. We naturally return to spirit form. In this state, servants are more like guardian angels. We can only be observed by masters connected to a ley line. Of course, we're still capable of conversation or reconnaissance. Wow, that's handy. That would make it really hard for other masters to locate you. Yes, but just as mages can sense other mages, servants can sense other servants. A servant who is skilled in magecraft may even be able to locate other servants from afar. Archer has it in one. Masters are supposed to be capable mages. The more magical energy the mage has, the better they are at detecting traces of magical energy. As far as I know, however, there isn't anyone else around with that degree of power. Hmm. So what about you? Can you tell where the other servants are? Master, have you forgotten which class I am? Do you expect a knight to be able to scry far away enemies? Yeah, he has a point. Archer's magical energy isn't on that level. It's likely that only the magically powerful caster is capable of easily locating distant foes. At least we don't have... At least we don't have Zero's caster. Ah. Fine, then follow me, Archer. I'll show you the world you've been summoned to. I doubt it'll be particularly new to me. Moreover, Master, haven't you forgotten something important? Something important. My goodness. You really aren't at the top of your game. We still haven't exchanged the most critical point of our contract. The most critical point? Is he demanding a golden exchange? No. That can't be it. The chance to take part in the Holy Grail War is already reward enough for a servant. There shouldn't be anything else left to trade. Wow. You really aren't a morning person. Archer sounds exasperated. His oh so sardardic manner of speech finally gives me an idea. Come to think of it, he's never once called me by name. Ah, uh, crap. My name. Finally caught up, are we? I suppose it isn't too late. So, Master, what is your name? What shall I call you? Ime-san. Bitch number one. 
uh, the one that tells me when to sit and when to jump and when to take a shit in the local lake. Archer sounds sulky. Yeah, it's only like he's been summoned <laughs> through the fucking roof and they had to clean up the roof. And then, yeah. Oh man, he really is a decent person. I'm sure of it now. After all, there's no tangible benefit to exchanging names. Servants are forcefully bound to their masters by the command spells. While names are key to contracting with a regular familiar, there's no need for a master and a servant to be so... intimate. But it's important to Archer. He's clearly trying to establish trust between comrades in arms, regardless of the command spells. I'm Rin Tosaka. You can call me whatever you want. I answer in a clipped tone, and willing to let slip any admiration. Hell, probably just call me something impersonal like Master or Hey You, which works out just fine for me. Except, Archer chews on Rin Tosaka for a moment. Smooth. Then, Rin, yes, the sound of that suits you very well. He says something really forward. But What's wrong, Rin? You look unwell. You've triggered my sundere! <laughs> Shut up! We're leaving, Archer! This this is no time to be sitting around. I turn on my heel and storm away, huffing. This is so infuriating, I'm not even sure why. Damn that Archer. Did he say that just to mess with me? I bet he did. Definitely sounds like something he'd do. Yes, I'm sure that's it. Must be all part of his plan to get me all flustered. I better be careful. Gotta work with this wise guy from here on out. Rin. <laughs> I take Archer outside. Fuyuki City, my hometown. It's broadly divided into two halves. There's Miyama, which is left over from the village the city grew out of. And Shinto, the developing modern region across the river. My house is Miyama, the old part. Is in Miyama. Yeah, I've that, that off of my brain. Yeah. Miyama, but, uh, Miyama is itself split into two areas. The European style neighborhoods, originally inhabited by immigrants from abroad, and the old Japanese style houses set against a mountainous backdrop. Both areas are situated on hilltops along the outskirts of town. Man, that would be hell to go up on a bike. Ugh. Anyway. The street dividing the two residential areas is fairly normal by comparison. How normal, you ask? This normal. This is the crossroads of Miyama. <sighs> On one side lies the road going up the hill. To the European neighborhoods where I live. Opposite is it the road to the Japanese houses, and between them is the path leading into Shinto, where my school and the shopping areas are, as well as the Ryodo Temple in the mountains. We come to the bridge connecting Shinto and Miyama. Years ago, a big train station went up in Shinto, bringing with it frenzied urbanization. They may belong to the same municipality, but Miyama and Shinto couldn't be more different. The name Fuyuki, written with the kanji for winter tree, 
is supposedly inspired by the long winters here. That would be so awesome. Which, by the by, are pretty long. Can I live there? I like, I like snow. Despite that, temperatures are warm. If February here is only about as cold as the very start of winter elsewhere. I bet if you randomly started digging, you turn up a hot spring or two. Though of course our temperate weather disqualifies this town as a hot spring resort location. We've got an odd climate where the mild winters suddenly turn to springtime bloom come April. My coffee's gotten cold. This is what Chinto looks like. A number of tall buildings have been erected as if in a hurry, giving the hastily developed city a distinctly artificial feel. It all happened in the last decade or so too. Ten years ago, there was a large fire that wiped out a residential area. Someone built a bunch of glass and metal buildings on the depopulated land. And here is the center of it all. This is Chinto's Park. What are your thoughts now that we've been to all the key spots? I ask Archer, who's next to me. Of course, he's invisible. It's a big park. Is there a reason why nobody's here? Feels that way, doesn't it? There's a story behind it, actually. I look out over the park. You'd think that a wide open space like this would have children playing in it, even on a weekday. But instead, there are only a handful of people. The place feels dull and lifeless. Also very... Ashen. I like it. It was 10 years ago, apparently. There was a big fire that burned for an entire day and only went out once it rained. Although the town was rebuilt, this place stayed basically the same. The burnt meadow eventually got turned into a park. Archer says nothing. I could tell he's sensed something odd, even if I can't see him. Noticed, have you? That's right. This is where the last battle of the previous Holy Grail war was fought. It all ended here. I see. So that's why there are so many roaches here. Uh -huh. You can tell? Servants are spirits first. Our very existence is similar to grudges or obsessions. That makes us sensitive to lingering emotions such as these. There were other areas around town that felt dense with such a feeling. But this is on a different level. From our point of view, it's almost like a reality marble. Tosaka butters under her breath. 
Archer's inflectionless voice mentions an unusual bit of magical jargon. His voice is inflectionless? Huh. Innate bounded fields. Mages call them reality marbles. Mm. Oh yes, my mom's neck just breaks. <laughs> <laughs> Reality marbles are considered one of the apexes of magecraft. They're said to be infinitely close to true magic. For the last few centuries, bounded fields have served as mage's defensive barriers. To put it in simple terms, they're like a home security system with real teeth. Bounded fields are conventionally erected on a piece of land or a building to guard against outside threats. They're merely an alteration of an area that already exists. Reality marbles, however, are something else entirely. You can think of them as a space that consumes reality itself. When a mage materializes their imaginary world, a representation of their mind, and overwrites the real world with it, we call the resulting field a reality marble. It's a large area of magecraft that twists, no, rebuilds the world according to a mage's wishes. Then, is, is something on your mind? Yeah? No, no, I was just a little surprised. I didn't expect to hear the words, reality marvel, from an archer. Is it so strange that I know it? Well, yeah. To mages, reality marbles are a taboo among taboos. As some of the most esoteric arts out there, it doesn't make sense that an archer would know what they are. I shoot a quizzical gaze in his general direction. In reply, I feel an incorporeal sigh. <sighs> Rin, the word hero implies someone familiar with both martial and magical arts. You're free to assume that your archer only knows how to use a bow, but I hope you don't hold the same illusions about the other servants. <laughs> Ugh. That, that does make sense when he puts it like that. Uh, okay, I get it. I, I didn't think that through. And I'll be more careful next time. Is that good enough for you? Rin, let me be blunt. You are certainly talented, but that makes you tend to underestimate other people. You should break that habit before you become an adult. You really don't know when to stop, you know that? Fuck. Break my habit. He's talking about me like an unruly racehorse. Listen, Cupcake, calling a woman a racehorse is not a slur. Currently. <laughs> no, you don't. you don't. You don't need to know when I'm online. You can just ignore the notifications that show up. Oh, forgive me. I didn't mean to suggest you're a horse. But it did feel like an appropriate choice of words. Uh, 
a slur. What? What if? <clears throat> what if I just slurred my speech for the entire the rest of this? It's just for you. And there is GB8. What's he doing here? <laughs> Great, y'all get to. <laughs> Y'all get to listen to me narrate. Enjoy. Hey, that's just as bad as... Ow! Thanks. I appreciate it, guys. Love you to pieces. My right hand suddenly flares with pain. Quiet down for a sec, Archer. The command spells on my right hand hurt. They're throbbing. Almost like a dull warning. Dull alarm warning their owner. Someone's watching us. I scan my surroundings. Wonderful. I, it's just what I want to be, is background noise. You are using me just as intended. Thank you, thank you. I mentally weave a detection web and cast it out over the park. I can't find them. Any luck, Archer? Doesn't look like it. I can't even sense them spying on us. Negative. Which means it's a master. Yeah, you, I, t I get to take an edge off the war crimes as I watch the anime girl commit war crimes in visual novel. It's a win-win situation, really. I don't know who it is, but if Archer can't tell, then it must be a master. We don't have all seven yet, but the fighting could start at any time. I like my brain skipped still and then said start at any time. Anyway. Maybe whoever's watching me is up for an early skirmish. Command spells. React to other command spells. If we're dealing with a master, then you should be able to identify them if we come across them. Would they be able to do the same to you? Yeah, but advanced spellcasters can hide their energy signatures. Our command spells may react to each other, but it still takes magical energy to activate them. As long as the master keeps their magic circuit shut, it'll be hard to find them. That's troubling. Does that mean we're broadcasting our position? Pretty much. If I looked around at home, I'm sure I could dig up a way to mask my power, but... You don't need to? Yep. They'll just come to us first, right? It saves us the trouble of looking. Arch doesn't respond. Maybe he's irritated with me. Look, you dumb bitch, I'd be too. What? Are you gonna tell me to not get cocky? I ask, a little defensive thinking of our earlier exchanges. Archer mentally brushes the question aside. You're at your best when you're like this. Yes, 
Let the small fry come to us. <laughs> I can feel the smirk in his tone. I'm not saying I like what he said, but it is enough to have an olive branch, I suppose. We'll start walking around town again. I spend the day taking him to all the important places, and even drop by some less significant spots that might be useful to know. After dinner, I make for our final stop. It's now after 7 in the evening. This is a good chance to show him the best vantage point in the city. The wind howls. We're atop the tallest building in Shinto. The commanding view of the city makes for a fitting end to our tour. So, pretty great view, isn't it, Archie? <sighs> I feel sorry for any future boyfriends. You really know how to run a guy ragged. Huh? What'd you just say, Archer? Nothing, bitch says what? Just an honest thought. It is a good position, though. If you'd taken me here first, I would have spared you the effort of all that walking. What are you talking about? It's nice, sure. We need to visit places to really get a lay of the land. This only gives you a bird's eye view of the, of the city. Not necessarily. You think too little of the archery class. One can't be a good bowman without good eyes. Really? Can you see my house from here then? Not quite that far. Just to the bridge or so. I can count the number of tiles there at least. Oh, wait, but the tiles on the bridge? I didn't expect his vision to be as good as the telescopes I often see on rooftops. Sharp eye doesn't even begin to cut it. I'm surprised. You really are an archer. Yay, Rin, you... you good job, Rin. You, you know what the... A fucking familiar that is designed to be able to hit things from a distance can see things from a distance. <laughs> Uh. Rin? Are you mocking me? Of course not. I just didn't take you for the bow and arrow type. My mistake. That's a misconception we'll have to address once we go home. With that, Archer goes quiet for a while. He must like the landscape from up here. Probably considering the layout of the city. I shouldn't interrupt him while he's thinking. I step away from Archer and approach the edge of the rooftop. All I can see from here are the lights below. Headlights flow through the streets, and I can make out people on the way home from work. I can't tell what kind of cars they are, or who exactly is walking. I can see them, but not clearly. It's not unlike how 
I could tell someone was watching me earlier, even if I couldn't pinpoint them. At the very least, I know someone's made their base in Shinto. I squint down toward the ground. There are seven masters in total. I don't know who they are, nor which servants are with them. At this point, every master is probably gathering intelligence on their rivals. Suddenly, I feel someone's eyes on me. There's no reaction for my command spells. I simply sense that someone else is looking at me. Down there. Up here, down. People are walking on the street, but one in particular is gazing up at me as if staring at the moon. And you take the moon. And you take the moon. And I'm not exactly sure who that is. I can't say for certain, and yet I know exactly who. I can't believe. That guy? What's he doing out this late? Have you found an enemy, Ren? Archer calls out to me. Maybe he can make out my rising hostility. Wait, did you just casually spot Shiro like a fucking hawk? I swear to god. Not really. It's just someone I know. A normal person who has nothing to do with us. Y you saw his red hair from a fucking mile away. Unable to clamp it down. I irritably snap back at him and step away from the roof's edge. He couldn't have seen me from the ground. I'm sure it was just a coincidence. I haven't given myself away. And yet... My mage side is screaming at me for allowing an eyewitness to catch sight of me. By the time I get back to Miyama, it's 9pm. Unlike Shinto, Miyama is mostly residential. After 9, there isn't really anyone outside, and the streets are silent as if it's much later at night. That's it for the tour. Did you get a good look at the city? Hmm? Yeah, I understand the layout. I'll pick up more details along the way. And we're done for today. I'm still not feeling great, so I'm going home to rest. I start up the hill at a relaxed pace when I notice someone up ahead. At Sakura? Uh oh. That would not be a good time to run in her. Why are you hiding? Quiet! Uh, there's someone I know up ahead. I skipped school today, so I don't want her to see me. As I answer, I keep an eye on her. In the middle of the street. That's the first year student I know. And a foreigner, I don't. <laughs> ah, he looked familiar, didn't he? Did anyone of those fate series? They're talking. No, it looks more like he's trying to pick her up. Well, she'd rather be anywhere else. Like, when does he not look like he's trying to pick up anything and then moves? They're in. Are you acquainted with the foreigner? No, I don't know who that is. There are a lot of European houses here, so maybe he's a tourist. Even as I finish the sentence, I'm mentally telling myself off for being so soft on that girl. Acha? Is he human?
Who knows? I can tell he has a human body, so that makes him no servant at least. Yeah, he isn't a master either, so it's probably just some lover's tiff. So, even I know that she isn't the sort to get caught up in something like that. They're gone. The girl's going up the hill. The man. The blonde-haired man descends via the street we came by. I am very certain that he knew exactly where we were and just didn't give a shit. You could use this room. Any questions before I go to bed? Hmm. None in particular. It was wise of you. It was wise of you to avoid a premature battle. You should let your strength recover tonight. Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. Make me that tea again. Once I'm back in my room, the fatigue washes over me. Oh yeah, I need to call Kirei first. That annoying priest left me a message. And now he's probably sent for a backup mage. Isn't my problem, but he is my legal guardian. I owe him a phone call at least. Phone, phone. Punch his number into the telephone. Before long, the fake priest picks up. Hey there. It's me. I contracted a servant yesterday, so you can register. You can register me as a servant master now. <laughs> you can register me as a master now. There's a brief pause. Kire's silence is deafening. I can feel its weight even through the earpiece. Understood. What will you do next? You should stop by. I have something for you from your parents. They asked me to pass it on to you. Only if you became a master before adulthood. Oh. Oh. Every time my father's will. I already decrypted that. I'll drop by the church if I feel like it. Bye. Wait, Rin, now that you are a master... Hang up before he finishes. Get fucked. <laughs> if I have to listen to Kirei's nagging while I am this tired, I have a feeling my magical energy will drain away instead of recover. Alright, I should be ready. All that's left is seriously. What's up in my eyes? It'll be a brand new day. Ten years ago, my father fought as a mage in the Holy Grail War and lost. Now it's my turn to risk it all for the same prize. Or get fucked in the ass by Shiro. Which does make me question, am I gonna swap to Shiro? Or am I just playing as Rin the entire team for the prologue? I am confused. And after breakfast, I lay out my plans for the day. You're going to school? Yes. Do you have a problem with that, Archer? It's not a problem, but... Archer looks reluctant, but doesn't protest. 
After spending a whole day with me, he probably understands now that Rin Tosaka doesn't go back on her word once she's made up her mind. God damn it. I am strong, independent woman. <laughs> I can sense his disagreement, even if he doesn't voice it. But I've also learned that Archer has a sincere side beneath all that sarcasm. He won't whine about a decision he's accepted. Yep, he's loyal and awkward like that. He might be autistic. That's what my intuition says, at least after watching him yesterday. Rin, now that you're a master, you need to always be wary of enemy masters. If you're ambushed at school, it'll be difficult to protect you. <laughs> oh, you sweet, sweet summer child. Not necessarily. Listen here, Archer. I don't intend to alter my lifestyle just because of this. Besides, masters fight out of public view, don't they? I don't think anyone would try to sneak up on me in front of everyone at school. Let's disregard the fact that somewhere in America right now someone is probably getting shot at school. <laughs> Let's disregard that fact, shall we, Rin? If that's your choice, then I'll follow along. But... At least let me stand guard in spirit form. Surely you don't intend to go there without me. Is some of the, like, curtain back there on the chair? I see it right there. No, whatever. Of course not. You'll stay with me whenever I'm outside. Not just a school. That's a servant's job, so I'm counting on you. Glad to hear it. A knight has a duty to repay his lord's trust. You won't be disappointed. Still, hypothetically speaking, what would you do if the enemy was in a place you thought safe? Are we supposing that there's a master at the school? Rin, you are at an anime. At least half of the masters are going to be school students. Yes, well, it's hard for anyone who isn't a student or teacher to enter. It could spell trouble if a master has already infiltrated. I don't think that's likely. The Tosaka are the only functioning mage family left in this town. The other one's gone belly up. So they won't produce any masters. How do you know? Man, that's a horrible way to talk about your sister. Hey, if there's any other mage families in Fuyuki besides the Tosaka, you could bet I've looked into them already. He isn't a master. As the heir to that family, he can't wield the strength to become one. We can safely ignore him. I see. So 
So there is another mage at your school, but they lack the magical energy to be a master. That's right. Most of the other masters will be coming from the outside. They wouldn't be at my school. Or now, perhaps. I'm now remembering that even though I watched, like, the anime Unlimited Blade Works and... Ah, uh, I forget the rest of them. It was all the, like, other routes of the, uh, light novel. Uh, visual novel. I mean, um... I don't remember most of the masters besides, like, all the ones from Zero, weirdly enough. And I can only remember, like, three. No, wait, I can only remember about, like, four... Or f there's, there's a few of them I forget. That's what I'm going at. But there are exceptions to every rule, Rin. What will you do if you encounter an unknown mage at school? I'm telling you, it won't happen. Mages are sensitive to each other. I've spent a whole year at that campus. So I'd be able to sense any mage, no matter how hard they try to hide. Oh, dear, what my cup? I just knocked over a cup of water. Oops. Uh, luckily, it's almost empty, so it's not that much of an issue. I'm certain there, there are only two mages at school. Me? And that Proby, without enough power to be a master. Proby. Get it now. You're just being paranoid. The scenario you're imagining won't happen. That's why I said hypothetical. But the unexpected has a way of happening. Sometimes, destiny decides to make the impossible come about. If we find ourselves in such a situation, I hope you'll remember not to take it out on me. As I told you so. <laughs> Archer chuckles dryly. His smug attitude already makes me want to do exactly that. But I'll be late for school if I let him keep pushing my buttons. Look, it won't happen. It's a what if, because if it would never happen in the first place. And if it does, it would just mean that I was too naive. Rin. Rin. Yeah, uh, yeah. I remember you said that. <laughs> Let's get going then. It takes 30 minutes to get to your school. So you'd better leave soon if you want to be on time. You cannot use me as a bike. I am legitimately shook. It really did happen. I'm surprised as well. Ah, uh, it really does pay to be a pessimist. This is our exchange the moment we pass through the front gate. It's almost time for homeroom, so there are students on their way to class all around us. Archer and I stand still like a pillar amid the swirling human sea. Hmm. 
The air isn't just stagnant. Someone's set up a bounded field, don't you think? It isn't finished. But yes, prep work is already underway. They must think they're a big shot to go about it this openly. More an unbelievable amateur. Only a third-rate mage would make such a conspicuous field. Someone with actual skills would conceal it until it was time to strike. And how would you rate this mage? Who knows? I couldn't care less. Rin, this is exactly what you should be caring. Ah, I feel bad for Archer. More importantly, trying such shoddy work in my territory is just going to earn them a beating. Delivered by you, of course, Archer. <laughs> I let out an indignant huff as I cross through the grounds. Where's I need a soundbite of Leon going, Ugh, women. As a mage, there's no sugarcoating it. I won't be satisfied until whoever made this bounded field gets what's coming to them. I'm on my way back from the music room after second period. I spot a first year floundering in the hallway. She looks like she could use a hand with the large stack of documents she's carrying. Let me help, Sakura. Printouts? Our class is supposed to take care of world history. What is that Kazuki thinking? Making you carry all of these. Here, I'll take half. It's fine. Are we taking these to your classroom? No, to Mr. Kuzuki. He said he needs to take them back because there's a typo. I can believe that. Kazuki's got such a huge stick up his butt. His feet don't touch the ground. He wants to spend an entire exam over a single typo. Hmm? You mean an exam here at the school? Yeah. It was during midterms last year. It was near the end when everyone's answer sheets were already filled. He just came out and said, There's a typo. The questions are incorrect. The exam is suspended, and we'll redo it tomorrow. The teachers were as surprised as we were, and people still talk about it. That does sound like Mr. Kazuki. He's the type of person who believes teachers shouldn't make any mistakes. But he goes overboard. You'd better learn while you can that once Kazuki's got his mind set on something, he's as hard to move as a mountain.
<laughs> you must like him. It's unusual to hear you talk about someone like that. Is it? I do wish he'd just relax. Though he's alright just the way he is, ultimately. The faculty at our school is made up of both really nice teachers and some real scary ones. Is this still in the prologue? Holy fucking shit! Holy fucking shit! Three hours! Three hours we are into the prologue! The faculty at our school, yeah. It's a delicate balance that Mr. Kazuki, an important part of. He's the stick to the carrot. You'll see more of him next year, since he teaches ethics. Alright, uh, Sakuba. There's something I want to ask you. What is it? It's about yesterday. Were you talking to a foreigner? Ah, you saw that. It just happened to. What's going on? Is he the one you know? No, I um, don't really know who he was. It sounded like he was lost. He asked a lot of questions, but I couldn't really understand what he was saying. Fucking Gaijin speaking in English. Am I a translated visual novel? More likely than you think. Ah, and that's when she slipped away. I see. Uh, sorry, I was just curious. No, I don't mind. Oh, it's just in here. I can get the rest now. Okay, see you later then. I return the printouts to Sakura. Before I head back to my classroom, I find myself stopping. How are you lately, Sakura? Ah, I'm... Okay, I'm doing well. I see. Let me know if Shinji's up to something. He doesn't know when to quit, so... It'll just keep worse if you keep quiet. You don't have to worry. He's been nice lately. Have you whipped him? I feel like he needs that. There isn't much I could say to a smile like that. We say our farewells again, and I leave my underclassmen acquaintance. School day is over. The classroom's steadily empty and the campus darkens by the hour. The crimson sun will set soon. Once night falls, there won't be anyone left around. Let's begin. Archer, first we'll investigate the bounded field. Once we determine what type it is, we'll decide whether to erase it or leave it. I speak to my invisible partner. I swear, not schizo. I feel I'm not in acknowledgement. Bounded fields are meant to protect their casters. 
You can consider them a terrain-based magecraft formed by weaving magical energy into a net and applying it to the earth to affect the inside of the field. There are countless types of effects they can have, ranging from wards that isolate an area from the outside world to avoid detection, to fields that limit the type of magecraft that can be activated within. The most offensive type suppresses biological functions inside the area of effect. And that's what's been applied to the school grounds. While it isn't finished, everyone in the school will collapse once it's activated. <sighs> Something like that wouldn't work on me, though. Bounded fields are, after all, targeted at the area I'm in, not me specifically. Such indirect magical interference won't affect a mage with magical energy flowing through her body. Similarly, the electrical charges that flow in the atmosphere won't disturb the electrical currents within my body. That means the bounded field has some other purpose. Whoever it is that put this thing here isn't trying to defeat a master with it. I don't want to believe it, but they're targeting all the people within the school. There's only one possible reason to do that. It's a thought I can't stomach. After checking all around campus, I finished my search on the roof. It's thoroughly dark outside now. The school gates shut at 6pm. And it's now 8pm. We are now committing a crime. Archer and I are the only ones left, and Archer's in his spirit form. That makes the seventh one. Looks like this is the origin point. There are eight symbols, boldly drawn on the rooftop. They're purplish red marks that only a mage can see. I've never seen or heard of sigils like these. Why does the sigil look like... It, it looks like a like a cutaway that they do in hentai, right? Of like when they show like the little drawing of the little sperms hitting the hitting the egg in hentai. <laughs> what the fuck? That's that's a hell of a sigil. Whoever set up this bounded field did it recklessly. But while imprudent, the magical working itself is an order of magnitude beyond my own skills. I could temporarily erase the energy of the curse, but I have no way to dispel the bounded field itself. All the spellcaster needs to do is supply it with more energy to reactivate the curse's effects. Archer doesn't comment. He's probably remained silent since encountering the rooftop sigils, because he too has realized their nature. His bounded field does more than drain its victim's stamina. It will literally melt everyone inside once it's turned on. They'll become part of the stew. All will become soup. There are bounded fields which rob victims of their life force and spiritual energy. But the spell that's been applied to the school grounds is on a whole different level. This is no less than a soul eater, a blood fort which melts the human bodies inside it and forcefully collects the souls that ooze out. Since antiquity, souls have always been difficult to handle. They are theorized to exist and are considered to be necessary components of magecraft. Only one mage has ever proven their existence. Our definition of souls stop at that which examines within and at that which is transferred between vessels. It not only extracts souls, but it didn't capture them in one place, it defies comprehension. Which it may be supposed to do with a bunch of energy we can't even convert. So if I had to think of a purpose for it. Acha. Is that what you and your kind are? Comes out colder than I intended. You summarize correctly. Correctly, I did say that we are fundamentally spiritual beings. That means we feed on the second and third factors, the soul and the mind. And just as you sustain yourselves with the flesh of creatures, we servants derive nutrition from the mind and soul. Well, 
Well, said nutrition doesn't change our base abilities. Acquiring more of it does make us more endurable. It increases our reserve of magical energy, in other words. He's right. The way to make your own servant stronger is to indiscriminately attack human beings. So, your own master's magical energy isn't enough. It's sufficient, but it never hurts to have more. In war, some weaknesses can be compensated with material when one is lacking in fighting strength. It's a basic strategy for a master to take energy from the humans around them. In that sense, the Bounded Field is an efficient tactic. And remember, Cupcake, I was mentioning... Gotta be committing some war crimes! <laughs> We've had a... we have a Bounded Field here that's gonna... gonna kill an entire school. <laughs> Archer's saying that I shouldn't murder people? And take their power if I want to win? It's so simple. I've always known this to be true. And I know it's the path I'm supposed to walk. That really pisses me off. Don't ever bring it up again, Archer. Staring at the sigils, I make my stance clear. Oddly, Archer sounds just as put off. I agree. I'd never do such a thing. His answer comes firm and resolute. Time to erase this then. It won't do much good, but I can at least slow it down. I approach the sigil and extend my left hand. The magic crest engraved on my arm is like a grim roar passed down through the Tosaka line. The mental switch is flipped. I pass the magical energy through the magic crest, load a verse of bounded field erasure, take a deep breath, and activate it. Idres, surgical removal, a vest too. I then send a pulse of magical energy via my left hand. I should wash away the sigil for now. What? You gotta erase it? What a waste. Suddenly, a third voice chimes in while I'm casting the spell. I whirl around. You. A man is perched on top of the water tower, some ten meters above, looking down at me. He's clad in a deep blue that blends into the night. His mouth is drawn into a grin, and he has a bestial air about him. The beast's gaze is sharp and clear. In this bizarre situation, the man in blue watches me, as if he's greeting a friend he hasn't seen in a decade. Did you do this? Nah, it's a mage's job to play a little tricks. We just fight whomever we're ordered to. Isn't that right, mate? His tone is lethal, yet carefree. This man could see Archer. You're a servant, though. Yeah, the, the pauldrons on his shoulders didn't give it away. <laughs> the weird, funny armor. But I am. And if you know that, lass, you must be my enemy. <laughs> my spine tenses. The man's voice is detached and nonchalant. But it's colder than anyone I've ever heard. So scary, it's 
Nauseating. It's the best move here. I don't know. But my brain is still working enough to tell me that I absolutely must not fight him. Oh, I'm impressed. Here, I was thinking you don't know heads from tails, but you figured out what really counts. I blew that. Shouldn't have gone out of my way to taunt you. Man raises an arm. It appears in a flash. This once empty hand and now holds. A scarlet two meter long weapon. <laughs> my legs throw me to the side before I can think. There isn't time to even hesitate about jumping off the roof. With all my might, I make a mad dash for the fence, intending to barrel right through it. The cyclone lifts my hair into the air. It was by the skin of my teeth. In that instance, something slices through the space I was just in, tearing the fence apart with it. <laughs> You've got a nice pair of legs on you. Blue Warland pursues me. There's no way out. The fence is behind me. My flanks are cut off. I won't make it. Light mass have in pressure. I react swiftly. My magic crest surges to life, so I can weave a single count magecraft. A spell lion's mass manipulates gravity. Light as a feather, my body bounds into the air. I just now realized my audio is really low for the actual music going on. There we go. Now you can actually hear it. There's your novel. There. This whole time, all of the sounds of the Japanese voice actors, and you just haven't heard shit. No, I got this. And I jump over the fence to plummet off the roof. Air resistance and gravity push and pull along my body. It's about 50 meters to the ground, 1.7 seconds away. Too slow. He's going to catch up to me. Folks, go to his address. Sight's precept. The funeral returns to the earth. Atra, handle the landing. I let Archer absorb the shock of the landing and break it to a dash as soon as we touch down. I couldn't stay on that rooftop. We need a less cramped arena from which to maneuver freely. A battlefield without obstacles where Archer and I can truly shine. It takes me less than seven seconds to escape from the rooftop to the schoolyard. A distance of over 100 meters crossed by at a pace no normal person can manage, much less clearly see. And yet... You really do have good legs. I almost feel bad about having to kill you here. Against the servant, it's wasted effort. At the same time I draw back, Archer materializes before me. It's a cloudy night. Archer's hand grips a short sword that faintly reflects the moonlight. Hey. The man's lips twist into an ominous sneer. Yeah, that's how this ought to be. Can't say I hate guys like you who are quick on the uptake. The whirlwind howls. It's the weapon he swung at me on the rooftop. This spear of blood like crimson that came mercilessly for my head. It's me. That must make your servant a saber. It doesn't feel like one. Who the hell are you? Honest's carefree ease from a moment ago. 
Archer stays silent, facing off against Lancer's unconcealed bloodlust. There's just under five meters between them. Lancer's weapon is nearly two meters long. It doesn't feel like the best, the this beast of a man is going to be deterred by a mere three meter difference. Meter difference. Hmm. <laughs> I can tell you're not the type to settle things man to man. That must make you... Archa. Archer doesn't take the bait. In an unusual clash, the blue and red stare each other down. The two knights, somewhat similarly dressed, mutually calculate the other's demise. Alright. All that's left is to throw down, draw your bow, Archer. Not how I usually do this, but I'm polite enough to wait that long. Archer doesn't answer. His back, as steely as a sword, seems to convey that. He must not have anything to say to someone he must defeat. That's when I realize it. I'm such a fool. Archer was waiting for my word. Acha. Acha. Oh, to him without getting any closer. Don't hold back. Show me everything you've got. <laughs> That'll laugh. The Red Knight surges forward, his lips curled in response. Wind swells. The Scarlet Boy flies forth, blade in hand. A blue spear thrusts, intercepts him. If the charging archer is a gust of wind, then the spear tip that rises to meet him is a divine storm. Striking blades. Elegant de Pérez! Archer is put on, def on the defensive, fending off the swift thrust with his short sword. The man in red is stopped in his tracks. His advance denied by the enemy. Can't even breach the two meter coverage of the spear. A bow arm wielder can control his opponent's range. Lancer, with his nearly two meter reach, needs to simply engage his foe whenever he comes within range. It's easier for him to stab an advancing opponent than it is for him to go after Archer himself. Despite this, Lancer closes the distance himself to press the attack, all the while keeping Archer from advancing further. You're a damn fool of a bowman. Trying to challenge me in close combat? Lancer's snarl is fiery. With each thrust, Lancer closes in, the assault never letting up for a second. Moving in too close to suicide for a spear wielder. The advantage of a spear is the ability to control the enemy's position. Lancer shouldn't have a chance if he keeps closing in. Away. Well, that's only according to conventional wisdom. Unearing. Unceasingly. Lancer's spear seeks to pierce Archer's throat, shoulder, forehead, heart. The strikes are too swift to even leave an afterimage. Archer is forced to parry, block, or evade every move of the spear. Any strike, if true, will be a mortal blow. Still, Archer is a servant, even if he specializes with the bow. He won't be brought down so easily by mundane attacks. The thrust at his forehead is quickly bad aside, and Archer renews his charge in spite of Lancer's spear. One might think that swordplay is all there is to Archer's attacks, but he's exploiting a weakness of spear tactics. Against the spear's considerable reach, neither retreat nor evasion are viable defenses for long. A half hard withdrawal isn't enough to get out of range, while probing attacks will lead to evisceration. A reckless charge will similarly end in impalement at the edge of the spear's range. Archer and Lancer have more or less the same physical stature. Without heavy armor, it's difficult for Archer to penetrate the lethal storm of Lancer's attack radius. The Lancer's strikes are a different story. The high speed thrusts intended to pierce vital points are indeed terrifying. But each strike has a set trajectory and target. If one can predict these, then there are ways to avoid them. Just as Archer is doing, one can block the strikes aimed at vital points or just barely evade their arcs to create safe openings. 
Lancer probably underestimated him as a ranged specialist. The advantage of a long weapon is the generous range at which one can engage the opponent. By giving that up, Lancer has assured his... <laughs> the man Red stops in his tracks. I watch a nightmare unfold as if time has rewinded. Lancer's attacks become even faster than before. Archer's sword sword is knocked aside as he twists to avoid being skewered. Lancer's spear doesn't allow retreat. Or rather, his endless attacks are so fierce and sharp that even servants are doomed against them. We were the ones who underestimated our enemy. That servant. That Lancer and his spear can't be described in mundane martial terms. Who could possibly survive such a relentless barrage? Archer beats a desperate retreat while parrying strikes, creating slightly more distance between the fighters. In that moment, Lancer steps through the gap and unleashes an even more ferocious attack. The storm of attacks is a little different from what he's already been doing, but their execution is truly godlike. They've already clashed ten times. No, it's actually several times more than that. I can't see for shit. I am just fucking Rin over here in the court watching these two people try to kill themselves. <laughs> the torrent of spear strikes increase again in intensity and number, threatening to take Archer's life a thousand times over. It isn't even a change in speed, but in precision. At a steady pace, Lancer's spear comes down on Archer like a waterfall. How can Archer get inside his guard? With such a short weapon, all he can do is defend against the spear. He has no way to close in on Lancer. In fact, he's being forced backwards. The steel vacuum stretches out. I, I should be backing Archer up. The right words die in my throat. My magecraft isn't easy to aim precisely. I risk hitting Archer too if I if he can't get far enough away from Lancer. Meanwhile, Lancer's advantage will only deepen. And to be honest, I'm captivated by their duel. So this is a battle between servants. The Holy Grail War is a battle between familiars of the highest order, heroic spirits, the beings that we mages can't begin to approach. Servants. Familiars divided among seven classes and roles, serving seven masters. Supreme familiars called forth by the Holy Grail itself. Familiar is really a misnomer for them. Familiars are supposed to be subservient to minions who act on behalf of the mage. Normally, you'd imagine something like Puss in Boots. Eh? Oh, I guess you just mean like a cat. What? Where do we get Puss and Puss from Shrek? <laughs> Who translated this? An elegant white bird. Or a disobedient black dog. Something like that. Those sorts of familiars are what a typical mage can manage to command. Familiars are just that, from the Latin for menial servant. It's inconceivable that a mascot Sorry, Sid, sleeping there on the bottom left of the screen. Used for menial labor would be stronger than its master. Servants are a different story. They're quite literally the most powerful examples of humanity. Even the five magicians wouldn't be able to control them. It's difficult to summon a servant. But not because servants are more powerful than mages. Servants are beings that surpass magecraft itself. Labor. Be clear. Say, servants, are we getting so much exposition right now? Right now! <laughs> well, while Archer and Lancer are currently trying to kill themselves, let's go into a full on exposition about the classes and servants. And <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, servants are heroes of the past, myths, legends, fables, histories. We call the glorious superhumans from our traditions heroes, whether the tales are true or not. Immortalized by what humanity says about them, they cease to be merely human after death and ascend to something greater. People who work miracles, who save the multitudes, who accomplish great feats, are elevated to the status of heroes, either in life or after death. They become a type of elemental we call heroic spirits. Guardians of the human race. 
doesn't matter whether they were historical people or characters from mythology. Heroes are created by the thoughts of the people. We imagine them as the idols we wish they were and treat them as if they were real. Objective truth is irrelevant. Fame and faith are sufficient to give form to these legends. Their humanity's ultimate ideals, the greatest among us. That's what it means to be a hero and a heroic spirit. Naturally, it's impossible for a mere human to control something greater than themselves. What mages usually do is borrow a portion of the power and imitate their feats. Summoning a complete heroic spirit is simply impossible. Yet the Holy Grail makes it, a, makes it a possibility. It allows us to summon these spirits in the flesh and even bind them to our command. The sheer absurdity of it proves the Grail's omnipotence. That's how heroic spirits are summoned from across time, whether from the age of gods or as recent as a century ago. The seven heroic spirits serve and protect their seven masters, and each master sends their servants out to defeat enemy masters. It's a deathmatch between heroes of every age and every land. That's the story behind the ritual we call the Holy Grail War. Of course, there are limits to what the Grail can do. Even the Holy Grail can't indiscriminately summon mythic beings akin to elementals. Just as a form created by the people is required to materialize the sixth theoretical factor known as demons, heroic spirits need a material form to operate in this world. This is their temporary label and the way they're allowed to exist in this world. The Holy Grail provides vessels that heroic spirits can easily materialize in, called classes. And only heroic spirits that fit these classes can be summoned. A class is like a passport. A what? That lets a heroic spirit visit the modern era to act as a familiar. It's a material vessel, vessel that they temporarily possess. Uh, excuse me, I need to get my visa from the Throne of Heroes to materialize in the Holy Grail War? Yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> there are seven masters and seven heroic spirits to serve them. Each is assigned one of seven classes. We're really going full into this <laughs> while they're trying to kill each other. Oh boy. Uh, Saber, the Knight of the Sword. Lancer, the Knight of the Spear. Archer, the Knight of the Bow. The Rider, the Cavalier. Casto, the Mage. Assassin, the Silent Killer. Bazaka, the Mad Warrior. Only heroic spirits of attributes corresponding to the seven classes can be summoned to the modern world, and they become servants whom the masters command. Until the store, until the series gets popular enough, and then we have to retcon this and add more classes and more exceptions to the rule. But, however, seven. Only one. Only one keyblade. That's the servant system. Humans summon and make contracts with heroic spirits beyond our ability to handle, all in hopes of winning a miracle beyond our kin. It's the greatest of battles that can only happen here in this land, like no other Holy Grail War. I feel like at this point, Lancer and Archer are just having a homoerotic stare down. The duel reaches an even higher pitch. The short sword goes flying from Archer's hand after blocking one of Lancer's strikes. Lancer's skill is consummate. A seemingly straight thrust suddenly whipped into a disarming arc at Archer's wrist. It was an attack that Archer couldn't have avoided even if he saw it coming. There is an effective way to parry the spear of his sword. The forceful block is countered with an even keener strike, while defending with minimal force will never create an opening to exploit. clash between sword and spear shaping up into an intense struggle to defeat an enemy outside of Archer's reach. Manuki. You fool. 
Why is your spear veined? <laughs> I just now thought of this. There's no hesitation in Lancer, even as he taunts Archer. Why is your spear red and have veins on it? I've known this series for a long time, and I've never thought about this until now. And anyway, he pauses from the constant pressure he puts on Archer. Does he intend to settle the duel in an instant? Lancer takes a firmly rooted stance, trading a fiery glare with the now unarmed archer. It happens in an instant. In the span of a breath, Lancer loses a flurry of blows that's no less than a flash of light. Imperceptible. Forehead, neck, and heart. The spear moves to skewer all three. And yet... Another flash of light counters the first that I couldn't even follow. Archer's hand grasps the short sword once more. Like the weapon he used earlier, it's a Chinese sword, not dissimilar to a cleaver. But the greatest difference between them is... Dual wielder, eh? Blade and blade. In each hand, he grips a sword. Each clearly meant to complement the other. <laughs> Playing swordsman, are we? Lancer Spear sings through the air. Becomes even faster, as if to herald Archer's certain death. Turn the sound down a bit. There you go. The duel becomes a symphony of clashing blades. The two steel instruments play a resounding chorus. The sparks of their conflict rising to a never ending crescendo. The battle is like a vacuum. It sucks in all the air around it, making me feel like I'll be cut if I even dare to approach. It all happened in an instant, really. But as I watch, with bated breath, the moments seem to stretch on. Lancer keeps his foe out of his fatal pocket, while Archer attempts to close the gap with his shield of dual swords. They've clashed over a hundred times already, Archer losing a weapon each time. But instantly, another sword appears in Archer's empty hand, and Lancer is slightly driven back each time. Lancer finally acknowledges his miscalculation. He has no idea who he's fighting. But it would be a mistake to keep dismissing his opponent as a bowman. Space opens up between them. Lancer puts significant distance between them. Maybe he intends to start over. That agility is normal. Archer's charge defies human ability, but he's sluggish next to Lancer. The swiftness of Lancer's retreat had the speed and grace of a leopard. No. 27. I've disarmed you 27 times, and you still have more? Lancer sounds irritated. Actually, he sounds more confused than upset. I feel the same way. According to my father, servants typically only have one weapon. They're supposed to be singular relics of an unimaginable power, not expendable items to be drawn over and over like Archer's doing. Servants are heroes whose spiritual rank are elevated to the magnitude of elementals or divine spirits after death. In a way, they're not unlike angels and demons. They're powerful familiars on their own. But their greatest strength is the mighty weapons they prove that prove they're heroes. We call these magical items noble phantasms. They are the favored weapon or armor that a servant used while it was a living hero, and it's literally the servant's secret weapon. To a servant, a noble phantasm is a one-of-a-kind armament. It's the servant's indispensable ultimate weapon as well. The same goes for Lancer's spear. It can exhibit its power as a noble phantasm if he so chooses. The Noble Phantasm is a formidable weapon on its own, but its true power is expressed by invoking its true name. Heroes' weapons are known to have slain dragons and gods who have conquered the earth. Servants activate Noble Phantasms with their own magical energy. It's not unlike Magecraft, really. Servants use their Noble Phantasms as catalysts to recreate destruction from their legends. 
An Opal Phantasm is most certainly not a disposable tool. Archer has produced dozens of swords by now. Each seems like a masterwork unto itself. But they surely can't be his noble phantasm. He's an archer, after all. His secret weapon must be some kind of bow. <laughs> What's the matter, Lanza? It's not like you to be so cautious. Where did all the fire go? Sneaky bastard. Think you can bait me like that? The cause of Lancer's irritation is obvious. Lancer has been fighting as a spearman, while Archer has been fending him off as a swordsman. Meaning that Archer hasn't revealed his cards yet. This must be frustrating to deal with. <sighs> Fine. And let me ask you this. Which land are you a hero from? I've never heard of a bowman who's also a dual-wielding swordsman. It's easy to tell who you are, though. They say that only the swiftest heroes are chosen as lancers, but you are outstanding. Even among them. There can't be three spear wielders as fine as you in the world. And only one has such bestial energy agility. Oh. Well said, Archer. For a moment. The bloodlust is so strong I forget to breathe. Lancer's arms move. It's a deliberate stance without any of the nonchalance he's shown thus far. His spear tip dips as if to puncture the ground, but Lancer's eyes bore straight through Archer. Then, will you taste my killer technique? I won't stop you. You're a foe we have to overcome sooner or later. Lancer lowers his stance. Simultaneously. Thorny, bitter cold overtakes the schoolyard. The air freezes. I don't mean that metaphorically. It's literally ice cold. What the fuck? All of the mana in the atmosphere freezes solid. Only the warrior Lancer is allowed to breathe in this space. The spear in Lancer's hand is undoubtedly magical. Its true form, eager to burst forth. Oh no. He's going to die. I don't know what kind of noble phantasm that is, but Archer is finished. It's the first time I've had this kind of premonition, and hard as it is to believe, I don't doubt it for a second. If Lancer, if Lancer unleashes his spear, Archer will die. That's absolutely certain. As Lancer says, his spear means death. It, Archer will lose. Lancer will stab him through the heart and he'll die. Despite that, Despite these premonitions, despite this insight, I can't even help Archer. I feel like if I so much as lift a finger, it'll signal the beginning of the end. If there's a way to prevent Archer's defeat, then it can only be... Who goes there? A sudden appearance of a third party, who we've all overlooked. Huh? Ah! Lancer's ferocity disappears. I hear the sound of someone running away. From behind, I can clearly make out a school uniform. A student, someone who's still on campus. Apparently. And saved our lives. Archer answers coolly. Sure enough, the interruption did save our skin. I screwed up. I was so distracted by Lancer that I was keeping an eye on our surroundings. Wait, what, what are you doing, Archer? Okay, I'm gonna take this second to get some more water. Because <laughs> I've been talking nonstop for like two hours. I think it's been two hours. Let me check. Yeah, it's been two. 
Okay, let me get a drink. Drink! Squirt. If my contacts... Got some strawberry, strawberry drink. Surprised my model stayed on screen this time. What? Usually just disappears when I walk away. Mix, 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 mix. Literally using the appearance of redhead to. That de escalated everything and. Uh, what's the word? I think a word. Word, word, word. Uh, it made everything anticlimactic, made a good opportunity to go get a drink. <laughs> Can't you tell? I'm resting because there's no one left to fight. That's not what I mean. What about Lancer? He went off to chase the witness. Probably to get rid of them. For a moment, my thoughts grind to a halt. After the marcher, I'll catch up. Archer pursues Lancer immediately. Damn it! Such a dummy. Curse my own negligence. The standard mage policy to eliminate witnesses. It's to know I've been careful not to allow anyone to see me as a mage. To avoid that scenario. Why did it have to be today of all days? The night feels oppressive. Not letting even the moonlight through. The fine archer standing over the body of a student collapsed on the floor of a terrible cold hallway. Looks wordlessly down at the student. An odor reaches my nose. The sight of slowly pooling blood makes me realize that it's the smell of death. Follow him, Archer. Lancer should be running back to his master. If we can at least catch sight of their face, then tonight isn't a total loss. Archer goes off after Lancer. Only the fallen student and I remain in the corridor. I can't look him in the eye, but I have to. This is my fault. This is my fault. This is my fault. Since I was young, since I made up my mind to inherit the Tosaka legacy, I've been prepared for this. Mages aren't governed by good or evil. I've known all along that this path would be a bloody one. Single thrust. The single thrust from Lancer's spear. He got you in the heart, so there's no saving you. I don't know how many seconds ago Lancer killed him. It's just a matter of whether he was unlucky enough to get stabbed through the heart. The blood loss isn't as bad as I would expect for a destroyed heart, so maybe the injury isn't too deep. It might not be too bad, but he's still screwed if blood has been cut off to his brain. But yeah, 
If his heart was wrecked, then he would die instantly. Still not dead. You are really something. It's hard to hear, but just barely. My ears pick up faint breathing. That must be a death rattle. But it won't last more than a few seconds. I don't have the power to save him. I don't even have a way to heal my own wounds. I have to look him in the eye at least. I start to reach for the face of the prone figure when I realize that my fingers won't move. There. Shaking. But why? I'm used to this. I've made this choice countless times. I've lost so much thanks to my own mistakes, my own selfishness. That's why I've always been ready for this day to come. And why am I so angry at myself? I'm sorry. I'll keep you company. You deserve that much. I just want to say that this part right here is fucking really cool of Rin and makes her awesome. Just because it's a very respectable thing to do. It's like, I did not cause your death, but I will stay here. Is It's a very much a, maybe it's just a woman thing of empathy, but it's like, damn girl, that's sweet. Stay next to the dying kid. <laughs> I use cold logic to still my trembling fingers and legs and check the fallen student's face. A great weight falls onto me. I feel like I've just been struck by a hammer. Don't do this to me. Why did it have to be you? I grind my teeth. No longer to brace myself against the shaking. But because I'm truly angry. Why did it have to be him? Why him especially? I'm not upset for what I answer for silencing a witness as a servant should. But at school today? Of all days? At this hour? You fool. Why would you of all people? Sakura's face comes to mind. I'm sure she'll cry. And I find myself recalling a day after school some years ago. The sky glowed a distant red. A boy that always ran. And a silly little girl watched him absently from afar. That boy got absolved in something he shouldn't have. And now his corpse is in front of me. There's still a way. If I fail, I might lose my trump card, but there's a way to save him. <sighs> no. I'll lose it whether this works or not, so the outcome is the same to me. This is a mistake. His impending death is a foregone conclusion. It's my fault for not paying enough attention to what was happening around me, and his whole fault for having the dumb luck to be here tonight. There's no need for me to go through, go this far for him. My father, who left me with nothing to remember him by, did in fact leave me this heirloom to help me. It's a massive store of magical energy, meant to be a trump card that helps me win this war. Precious, precious treasure, this war. So what, stupid? I turn back and kneel by the dying boy. Well, that's that. The penny in my hand gets lighter. My father's keepsake is nearly empty. The clink, I drop it on the guy who was a second away from becoming a corpse. <sighs> Nothing else I could have done. There really was no other way. I don't have the power or skill to bring someone back to life. Especially not someone with a destroyed heart, damaged blood vessels, and brain death mere seconds away. All I could do is patching up his missing parts with brute force. You're lucky to still be breathing. If you were totally dead, then there would have been no bringing you back with any amount of magical energy. But he's still alive. 
Then I just need to help him the best I can. I would have really hated myself if I failed. But it worked out, I guess. Yeah, I feel fulfilled if I'm being honest. This wasn't such a bad experience. Though really, I'm lying to myself. I should go. I did what I came to do. Better get out of here before he wakes up. Yeah, there isn't any point in hanging around. Archer's off telling Lancer, so I just should just go home. On the way home, I remember. I left my father's memento at school. But now it's just a pendant, with all of its magical energy wrung dry. Oh well. I don't suppose I need it anymore. It might have a little bit of energy left in it, but it's less than the ten gemstones I'm carrying. What father wanted was for me to have enough magical energy to win the Holy Grail War. Now that I've used that resource up, its container doesn't mean much. I arrive home without announcing my return and plop down on the sofa. Archer still isn't back yet. I have a tired sigh and listen to the clock tick for a few minutes. <laughs> I need to get my head in the game. After a battle like that, what am I even spacing out for? I jump to my feet and make some black tea. I have plenty to think about. The servant we encountered most of all. I finally watched the battle between servants, which until today I had only known about through books. Answer, huh? I panicked when he seemed about to use his noble phantasm, but at least it would have let us learn who he is. Learning a servant's identity is key to defeating a servant. With the exception of the idiot who doesn't know his own name, a servant's greatest, greatest, greatest weakness is their identity. Once you learn a servant's name and identity, then you can mostly deduce that heroic spirit's noble phantasm. It goes without saying that since servants are heroic spirits, they have legends associated with them. Unraveling their history can reveal a lot about their abilities. Masters address servants by their class names to hide their true names. The more famous a hero, the more likely their weapons and weaknesses are to be known. A heroic spirit who has become a servant will never willingly divulge their identity. The knowledge is reserved only for their master. There is a tactic understanding that a master conceals their own servant's identity while trying to figure out the identities of the other servants. Including this one. There have been five Holy Grail Wars thus far. Each servant's quality depends on the caliber of the summoned heroic spirit. Naturally, a famous hero, or one of a legendary weapon, is powerful. Accordingly, it's difficult to summon such heroic spirits. For that, a summoner needs a connection to the heroic spirit they're summoning, such as a weapon the hero wielded during their lifetime. Even the Mage's Association, with all its resources, only has few such items in his possession. That's why most mages, myself included, summon a heroic spirit whom we have an infinity with. A servant's strength is determined by the caliber of the heroic spirit, or so the logic goes. But reality isn't so clear-cut. Even a superior heroic spirit might struggle when the classes in play aren't favorable. Class-specific abilities can have a large impact on the outcome of a battle. Each of the seven classes comes with additional abilities. Any interaction between these can allow one to triumph over a stronger opponent. To continue the example, it's said that great heroes were defeated by lesser known heroes in each of the previous four wars. As far as I know, the best servant class is Saber. Saber fought until the very end in each of the last four wars. Saber, Lancer, and Archer are said to have powerful magic resistance. Magecraft isn't especially effective against these three classes. 
After all, they're warriors from ages of myth and legend, when magic was still prevalent. Spells cast by modern mages would probably fizzle out on contact. That's why the first three classes are generally considered the most desirable. The other classes to watch out for is Berserker. Heroic spirits summoned in this class lose their sanity. As the name suggests, they become crazed warriors and puppets of their masters, but they are strengthened beyond the powers they had in life. It's also worth noting that the stronger our servant is, the greater its burden on its master. In the past, masters who drew berserkers couldn't control their servants, and ultimately self-destructed due to running out of magical energy. No exceptions. In the vast majority of cases, Holy Grail Wars are won by the summoned servant's abilities. Of course, there are plenty of ways for masters to win battles, but it basically comes down to fighting between servants. That's why a master needs to commit the utmost diligence and effort to summoning a servant. Discontented, I decided to come up with projections for the battles to come. <clears throat> Before long, it's 11 p.m. Yes, I fixed the clocks already. Archer comes home. Welcome back. How'd it go? Sorry. Sorry, I failed. His master must be a cautious one. I was at least able to tell that Lancer's master isn't on this side of the city. Figures. Lancer was all alone. And his master didn't seem like the type to show themselves. So, I see. Well, we knew it wouldn't be that easy. Everything can't go according to plan. So there's no use worrying over it. I'll just give up and treat tonight as a learning experience. You seem dispirited, Master. What happened to all that combativeness? combativeness? Don't tell me you're a coward after a single skirmish. If you order it, I could go back out right now and re-engage Lancer. Archer doesn't say it, but I can tell he thinks that's the right course of action. Oh. Must look pretty depressed right now, huh? That's not it at all. I'm not going back out there because I don't want to waste the effort. Hmm? Waste? What effort? だって、まだマスターの数が揃ってないでしょ。今夜のは山梨だったけど、海戦の合図があるまで戦わないわ。それが聖杯戦争のルールだって、父さんは言ってたし。the Masters aren't all accounted for yet. Tonight's fight was unavoidable, but we're not supposed to fight until the signal to start the war. Father told me that's the role of the Holy Grail War. Uh, see. But your father was a master too. Archer nods in understanding. Actually. Making a rather mixed expression. What? You got something to say to me? Yes, I forgot to ask you something. Kimiwa, Osanai Koroka, a master in Arabic soda terre, Sorin Stava Tikitamaro. Tsumari, Hazimaka, a master in Arukoto, Yoso Stata Wakeda. Ren, you've been raised from a young age to be a master and followed that lifestyle accordingly, yes? That means you always expected to become a master. Of course I did. Some mages are appointed as masters. But it doesn't work like that for me. I'm a Tosaka. Winning the Holy Grail War has been our goal for generations. That's right. 
That makes sense. So, you already had an objective in mind. That's what I wanted to ask you about. I need to know my master's wish before I offer my sword in service. So, Rin, what is your wish? My wish? I don't really have one. What? Ah, Archer's making a funny face. Yeah, you basically just told him you are trying to get yourself. You're fighting in a life and death war just because. I too would be like, bitch, you crazy. You crazy dumb ho. What are you doing? <laughs> That can't be true. The Holy Grail can grant any wish. Mages only become masters to obtain the Holy Grail. So what do you mean you have no wish? Archer drops all pretense. Uh, right. What's the Holy Grail is one. The victorious master's wish has nothing to do with the servant. Well, that's weird. Father mentions that servants have their own wishes too. But that's their own business. It shouldn't matter, matter. It shouldn't matter to Archer whether or not I have a wish. <sighs> Fine. Since you don't have a specific wish, what about a general one, like conquering the world, for example? I really need to draw Ren as Miku now, just because I know she has the twin tails and just said this. Why? The world already belongs to me. You know, Archer, the world is just the set of values that revolves around yourself. I've had that ever since I was born. I don't need to take over something that's always been inherently mine. This is where Archer stares at you like that's cool, bam. Not what I meant. Kind of what I meant. Not what I'm sure, sure. Archer looks at me with a strange expression. Yeah, you just. Woman, you have grown two heads. And he's stubborn. Bakana. <laughs> I don't believe you. The Holy Grail has the power to grant wishes. You could obtain anything you want in the material world. How can you not desire anything at all? True and real. World domination sounds like a pain, and I want to know what to do with it. Not everyone looks at things the way you do, you know? I'm having trouble understanding this. What do you fight for? If there's a fight to be had, I just want in, Archer. I'll take whatever I find along the way. I don't really know how the Holy Grail works, but if I find that there's something I want, I can just use it on that. Not all people live to acquire things, you know? I'm just not noticing that like, when I lean my head like this. I should have like a toggle that just... Because I'm just leaning my head on my hand. I should have a toggle for that. So I can just like pop up my arm. 
on my face. Mimic what I'm actually doing. Anyway, I digress. Meaning. That's right, I'm just fighting to win. Archer sighs and shrugs. Maybe he's fed up with me, but he finally relaxes. I give up. You truly are fit to be my master. Uh, I don't know how to respond to comments like that, so I wish he'd stop making them. <laughs> Servants may not have the right to choose their masters, but what makes you think I'm worthy of you? Do I need to spell it out? It's because you are, without a doubt, the strongest master. I don't need any other reason than that. Oh, well, thanks. That doesn't sound like flattery coming from you. I turn away to hide my embarrassment. Fuck. Archer usually acts like a smartass, so this sincerity is blindsiding me. Admittedly, I'm happy he feels this way. I've come to trust him, and he's come to trust me. I don't think this mutual sentiment is a bad thing. I suppose we should take a breather then. The seventh master has yet to appear, but it might not happen right. Wait, Rin, what happened to your jewelry? I... My jewelry? Oh, you you mean my you mean the pendant? I forgot it back there. It doesn't have any power anymore, so I don't need it, do I? I suppose not, if you say so. Yeah, it's a keepsake from father, but it's hardly the only memory I have of him. Don't say that. You don't always have to act so strong, Rin. As he nags me, Archer holds out the pendant I left at school. <laughs> you fucking smooth bastard! <laughs> Oh, you, you picked it up for me. Don't lose it again. It really belongs with you, Rin. Archer avoids eye contact as he passes the pendant to me, looking almost bashful. Okay. Thanks. I accept it. To be honest, I'm not sure whether to be embarrassed or play it off right now. The pendant is as I left it. As I thought, it really doesn't have an energy left. It's just an expensive jewel that, now that it's empty. But to put it in Archer's terms, maybe it still has a meaning as a memento of my father, even without its power. I mean, I look over my left, I have a necklace with, like, a ring that was probably off of my father's dead hand, so, you know. Rin, keep the pendant, please, for the love of all that is holy. I suppose I can laugh this off as a net win, since I spent my trump card to save someone's life. Wait a second. I jolt up in my seat. 
I wasn't thinking straight while I lamented what I had lost, but as I pulled myself together, it strikes me. He saw us, so I ought to alter his memories. Meanwhile, Lancer prioritized eliminating witnesses over fighting us. Lancer's thinking should reflect that of his master. Which means, if a master who went out of their way to kill a witness finds out that he survived, they won't let him live. I stand up from the sofa. It's already been three hours. I might not make it in time. I can't let this happen. Not after all the trouble I went through. You can't die after I saved you, you fucking idiot. I sprint through the night. Fortunately, I know where he lives. Not because I bothered to find out. No, not at all. But because someone I happen to know goes over to his place often. I've never been there personally. Good grief, you're really making this harder on yourself. Archer gripes unenthusiastically. I'm going to be as much of a... It's going to be as much of a struggle to rescue the guy now as it was to save him earlier. It's midnight. The sky is shrouded in clouds. I arrive at an old samurai estate. The building closest to the outside shows no signs of life. There aren't many neighboring houses, so it's unlikely anyone would have come even if they noticed something was amiss. My breath misses white. The wind picks up. It must be pretty strong because the clouds are starting to move. I find myself trembling despite the temperate Fuyuki weather, and a chill run down my spine. People call Fuyuki a warm place, but you can feel the winter chill from the hilltops. The air is bitingly cold. The chill presses in and makes it hard to hear. In the midst of this air that seems conquered by the cold, I keenly sense the enemy. He's here. The Lancer from earlier. I bite my lip. Something's on the other side of the outer wall. Lancer must have already infiltrated the house waiting for its witless owner to come home to his death. We'll just have to jump over. I'll think about what happens when it happens. Just I'm about to order Archer to go in. A flash. From the house emerges a radiant white light bright as the sun. Its presence is all-consuming. The power radiating from Lancer is being washed away by the newcomer's even greater aura. An instantaneous explosion of ether gives the spirit physical form, and the summon being overpowers Lancer. No way. All I can do is whisper in awe. But the truth is staring me in the face. As if to prove the point, Lancer bounds over the wall, fleeing the compound. Hey, Archer, is that one of your hypotheticals? Uh, perhaps, but now all seven of them are here in. Archer is calm. Meanwhile, my rational thought goes flying out the window. What happens next should have been obvious, but I'm not thinking straight. There's a strong gust of wind. The clouds cover the sky like an umbrella. Darkness shrouds the light. This outskirts of the town. A servant leaps over the wall and lands gracefully, like an unworldly bird. Archer reacts. I failed to even twitch in response. That's my fault. The fight ends before even a second passes. One second might be a brief instant to me, but it's a massive opening to a servant. A blinded wind closes in on me. Archer! Archer lunges in front of me. While the servant cuts him deeply. It really was just an instant. Is Archer who so gracefully fended off Lancer's brutal assault going down in one hit? Vanish, Archer! I made it, in time. Before the servant's next strike takes off Archer's head, I force him to retreat. Pain throbs in my right hand, because it was such an extreme order. It used up one of my command spells. Now I only have one left. But this was for the best. It's worth losing a command spell or two to make sure Archer doesn't die. Without skipping a beat, the servant comes for me next. Don't underestimate me. I 
I pull out a wind imbued topaz and feed magical energy directly into it without any extra steps. It's a cluster of wind spells that I've been feeding into it day after day, and they're enough to blow away a house or two without leaving a trace. This is one of ten jewels I've been building up for the last 17 years without skipping a single day. I'm trying to think of the logistics of how you could pour magic into a spell, into a jewel, as a, as a fucking infant baby that doesn't even know what the hell is an up or down. <clears throat> even I can't beat this thing with it, it should be enough to slow the new shit. Or not. It didn't work at all. The moment it touches the servant, what ought to have been a tempest that would hew apart anything in its path disappears like a simple stage magic trick. What terrifying magic resistance. Are you telling me that a mage doesn't have enough magical energy to hurt the servant? Oh no. My magecraft doesn't work and I've lost Archer's protection. I have no way to stop the servant. Even if I barely manage to dodge the first attack, I'm finished. I look up at the night sky. In it, I imagine a ruthless reaper coming for me, sprawled pitifully on the ground. Saber! What? The wind blows. Through a break of the clouds, the moon peeks out through the spiral like sky. The moonlight highlights her elegant profile. So, this is the face of the servant who drove off Lancer. Took down my archer in one blow, and shrugged off my magecraft like it was nothing. That was an admirable display of magecraft, mage. The girl's voice rings clear like a bell. Yet her voice is the stuff of nightmares at this moment. But this is the end for you, Master of Archer. The sword she thrusts at me seems to shine. I know that this is my dying moment. One glance is enough to figure that out. This is the card I wish to draw. The sword-wielding hero said to be the most powerful servant. I look up at the moon, prepared to die. There's no room to beg for my life, no time to escape. With my death, Rin Tosaka's Holy Grail War will have ended on the third day. you think I'd go out hating my foe, feeling nothing but shame and regret. But I don't feel that way at all. Something's seriously wrong with me. I'm one moment away from certain death. And here I am, entranced by my killer. Yeah. It's frustrating to be sure. But there's nothing I can do now. The strongest servant is going to kill me. He looks all at once heartless, utterly noble, and so very beautiful. The copyright claim anything. I wonder if that would be a good idea, or not, I don't know. But I'll just keep saying words just in case, just to drown out the music, or I could just kind of mute it. I could do that too. That might work too. I could just, you know, do... There we go. <laughs> I had a thought. <laughs> as much as I would love to just listen to the music. I'm sorry, but you can't have it get, get sent. <laughs> just in case. I don't know. Better safe than sorry. Oh, she might pop up. Complete the prologue. <laughs> now that we're done with the prologue, now I'm at the menu. We have spent... How many hours? What was it I hit load? 
I have spent almost six hours reading. And now we're at the start of the game. Or a visual novel. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I'll be back. I gotta take a fucking piss. Okay, come back to life. There we go. Break my neck a few times. Holy shit. Okay. Um. There, sound back. Gallery. I'm just curious. Yeah. Those do be pictures. That do be the opening. There do be music. Okay. Low chart. Prologue. Oh, sweet. Okay, I got, I got, I got thingies here to tell me where the hell I am in, like, Rots and ending list. How many endings do we got? Tiger stamp. Tiger stamp? Like the teacher? Okay, so, I actually, I only know that a few of the endings got turned to anime, like Unlimited Blade Works, for example. Uh, so there's the one, two, three, four, five endings. Okay. Oh boy, this is going to be a long series. Like, it's probably going to be so long, considering, if I take for example, it took me six hours <laughs> to get through the prologue. I mean, not exactly six hours, a little under that, like maybe four, five. Good lord, how long is it going to take me to get through all the endings? I may even say, screw it, and do more streams of Fate just to get through it faster. Kind of like what I did with Psycho Pump, because I was having so much fun with Psycho Pump, I was doing it a lot faster, da 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 And there's 40 stamps. Oh god. What are the stamps for? Oh, oh no. Oh no. Oh no. New game. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. This is gonna... Go take some time. I am the bone of my sword. Steel is my body and fire is my blood. I have created over a thousand blades, unknown to death nor known to life. I have withstood pain to create many weapons. Yet those hands will never hold anything. Shit. I didn't get to read it all, no! 
I don't know it off the back of my head. Come back. I was reading that. When I came to, I was lying in a burning field. It must have been a big fire. The familiar town was an unrecognizable smoking ruin. It looked like a scene from a war movie. The sight didn't last long, though. As morning dawned, the fires gradually died down. The towering walls of flame were shrunk to embers, and most of the buildings looked to have collapsed. It felt so strange being the only unchanged thing in the town. I was the only one left alive. I was either fortunate, or the house I'd been inside was built on the luckiest ground of all time. Either way, I was the only one alive. Since I'd survived, I felt a need to keep on living. I walked aimlessly, thinking it would be dangerous to remain where I was. It wasn't that I wanted to avoid becoming what had happened to everyone around me. Those scorched, blackened masses. It was a feeling of disgust. Some other emotion was driving me on. At the same time, I had no hope. It was a miracle I was alive at all, and I didn't think I was going to last much longer. There was just no way in hell I was going to survive. There was simply no way I would ever escape this crimson hellscape, no matter what I did. This was how desperate, how hellish this place was, even through the eyes of a young boy. And then I collapsed. Either there was no air around me, or I simply couldn't breathe anymore. I just collapsed. And all I could do was look up at the slowly clouding sky. The scorched black masses around me lay motionless. The dark clouds covered the sky, promising rain. Good. The rain will put out the fires. I took one final deep breath and looked up at the rain clouds. I couldn't breathe. But I still felt pain. I said that out loud on behalf of all those people who couldn't say those words themselves. That was ten years ago. Miraculously, in the midst of all that, I was saved. My physical body survived. But everything else was scorched, reduced to ash. When a young child loses their parents or their home, there's really nothing left of them. And so everything other than my body perished. But as simply as possible. In exchange for my body living, my heart died. I'm dreaming. I like how one of my eyes is blinking correctly. I squinted, seeing a bright white light. It was blinding. Light stabbed at my eyes when I woke. I doubt I really knew what the sensation of blinding light was in the first place. What? As my eyes adjusted, I woke alarmed. I was lying in a bed I didn't recognize, in a room that I didn't recognize. I was honestly stunned, but the cleanliness of the white room made me feel at ease. I am in a hospital? Where am I? I looked blankly at my surroundings. The room was spacious, and beds lined in, in neat rows. All the beds were full, and it looked like each bed's occupant was injured. But the room didn't feel depressing at all. That is a lie. It feels anxious. Everyone injured survived. I let my eyes wander. I looked out the window. The clear blue sky was so incredibly peaceful. We're at the beginning of a visual novel, folks. We're looking at the sky. This always happens. It's always, always, there's always a moment where we're looking at the fucking sky. Anyway, where was I? A few days passed, and I was finally able to take in the situation. I had no problem remembering what happened the days before. But I wasn't much different from a newborn during this time. Strange that it is, it is. That was closer to the truth than might seem possible. The fire was just that bad. I was rescued from the fire. I woke in a hospital. My parents were gone and my entire body was wrapped in bandages. I didn't really understand what was going on, but I did know that I was alone. 
It didn't take long for me to accept my circumstances. Maybe I had no choice, really. All the other children were in the same boat. And then later, in the moment, I, naive as I was, started to worry about what would become of me. He walked in. He appeared the day my bandages came off and I started eating on my own. His hair was disheveled, his suit tattered. He looked a bit younger than my doctor. He looked like someone's older brother than someone's father. Hello. You must be Shiro. He appeared the day my bandages came off and I started eating Oh. He looked a bit younger than my doctor. Yeah, yeah. His beaming smile seemed to blend into the pouring white sunlight. His voice was somehow irritatingly fake, yet extremely gentle. Oh, come right to it. Would you rather go to an orphanage or go home with a man you just met? He was offering to take me in. I asked if we were related. He said we were complete strangers. He looked like an unremarkable, unreliable guy. But then again, he was no more or less familiar than the orphanage. So I decided I'd go with him. Oh. Good. Then, let's pack up quickly. It'd be best if you got used to your new home as soon as possible. He started gathering my things hastily. Even as young as I was, I could see he wasn't any good at it. And after he made a mess of packing... I will tell you one thing, I have gotten real good at packing my shit. Like, being in the military, you kinda learn how to stuff as much stuff as possible in your itty bitty spaces, dude. You just, you get good at that. It just makes life easier if you know how to really take advantage of oh you have a backpack i i go to the grocery store with like my uniform and my backpack and the lady's just all like how are you gonna fit all those groceries in your backpack and i'm just like what oh, oh watch this <laughs> done backpack looks like it's fucking stuffed like a damn marshmallow that's been roasting over a fire but hey it closed. Nothing's crushed. Good enough. And then I just walked my way away out. Because... Fuck you! Fuck California! I am not buying a bag for 10 cents. Anyway, I got off topic. Oh, uh, I forgot to mention one important thing. Before you come with me, there's one thing you need to know. He turned, asking for confirmation. Hmm. He asked so casually, as if asking me if there was somewhere I wanted to go. Yep. Let me be direct with you. I'm a magician. He said it in a serious, almost ceremonious manner. It happened so fast. Now I think about it, I was also immature. I just accepted his words as fact. I took it neither as a joke or a genuine statement. Really? That's cool, Pops. I guess I said something like that, eyes wide in astonishment. And I was his child. Actually, I don't remember how that conversation went. Every now and then, my old man would break it up. He would recount that scene over and over, acting all embarrassed. That scene might have been the happiest day of my old man. A man named Kiritsuku Emiya's life. He can say that. It was one thing for him to tell a recently orphaned kid he was a magician. But I was no better the way I so eagerly bought into it. And that was how my old man adopted me. And how I took the last name. Emiya. Chiro Emiya. When I said that name out loud, I felt really proud of having the same last name as Kiritsugu. I'm dreaming.
from my childhood. Probably about eight years ago since I've... Since... It's about the time when I talked to my old man into making me his apprentice. Yutsuko had started going away on a regular basis once I was old enough to stay home by myself. He'd always give some childish, unbelievable explanation like, I'm going to go on an adventure on the world. Then he'd actually do it. From then on, that's how it always was. It wasn't unusual for him to be gone for a month, and at times he didn't come home for half a year. The Emiya Mansion is an expansive Japanese samurai-style house, and Kiritsuko and I were the only ones living there. It felt too big and empty for a child like me, and at times I felt lost. Man, that'd be like way too much space. I would. It'd be funny, because like, dude, I live in a studio apartment. I, unfortunately, have the pleasure of getting in the pod and live in the fucking pod. Kind of, sort of. But it's just a one-room space. I very much get by with, like, no room at all to myself. But I'm fine with that. I don't need a lot of room. I just need enough room to do my, uh, my hobbies and my work. And a place to sleep, that's about it. It's all my brain desires. And then, like, a place to go run around, because otherwise I would get, like, tired. Like, I would, I would get restless. Like a, like a, like a like hamster. Like, I, I, I gotta go run outside. I don't care that my limbs don't agree with this because of how bad my knees are. I still gotta go outside and do something. Gotta move around. Gotta, gotta move. And maybe people don't understand that. Maybe it's something that I acquired through uh, being in service and having to exercise. Anyway, getting distracted, getting distracted. I felt too big and empty for a child like me, and at times I felt lost. But I liked my life here. Whenever Kiritsuko came home from his trips, he would brag and tell stories like an excited child. And another child, one who shared his last name, always looked forward to those stories. I may have been alone in the mansion, but Kiritsuko's stories always helped less than that. He was always pursuing a dream like a boy. I was weary of his whims, yet at the same time, he always looked radiant to me. Maybe that's why I hope to be like him one day. Well, as childish as it might have been, I realized I needed to get my act together since I had an old man with his head constantly in the clouds. Aww. January 31st. Fate stay night. One. Day one. Air sound. The heavy, rusted hinges on the door creak as it's being pushed open. I'm actually thinking I'm going to end it here. It has been a solid three hours. And I have actually gotten better at uh, just talking nonstop for a few hours without it absolutely killing me. But that's just like a, with a week of practice that I've gotten there. Still, after three hours, my my tongue is numb, dude. <laughs> my tongue numb. I knew. Safe. But now, finally, I will finally actually have options to choose where the scene is going. Which is going to be sweet. And then I can find out what the, what the heck those stamps mean. But it's actually kind of sweet to see some of Shiro's inner thoughts about his uh, dad, his uh, ugh, adopted father. That's nice. Close the game. Pop uh, this up. Close that. There we go. Play the exit music that I use. There we go. And I'll just say a few exit lines before I stop. I know my buddies uh, popped in to harass me for a second, and then they left, but that's cool. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Then, uh... Check. Yep. All things good. Okay. Uh, 
Progress, progress, progress. We're actually playing the visual novel now. <laughs> and tomorrow I have set up to do some uh, boomer shooters. Yay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care out there. <laughs>